recording. Okay, so chapter three of the book really kind of talks through three concepts. We talk through the MVC model and what are the other models that we may be familiar with and how do those differ and, and all of those aspects. Then we talk about dependency injection and what those mean. And then the last thing that we're going to kind of kick through is this idea of unit testing. And that's going to be more in code, less PowerPoint. And the PowerPoint's just a visual, so just kind of follow it for what it's worth. Um, so I talked about this last week, this idea of MVC model is basically you have the user on one side there, and you can kind of think of that as the web browser more specifically. Type in a website address, you hit go, and that HTTP request gets packaged up and sent to the server. More specifically, when you send that, you're hitting the controller, so that class is your controller, the action is your method, so you're actually calling a method within your controller. That controller is probably accessing the models, which are your, your classes. Um, and just to kind of make a point around the terminology of model, the reason it's called a model is that your classes are supposed to model real life. So they refer to them as the models, so that kind of keeps that idea in mind that you know, you're supposed to be modeling real life with your classes. So if that's still kind of a foreign concept, make sure you start to wrap your head around that, that you're trying to emulate real life in the computer. Um, your models, depending on how they're structured, they may be connecting to a database using some sort of repository or utility class or web service or you know, anything, flat files, whatever it may be. Um, and then the models are that data is then pushed back into the controller, packaged up nice and pretty, and then shipped off to the view. The view then renders out that data, creates HTML, and then that HTML is then sent back as a response to the user. So that's that MVC approach. So how does that really differ? So you have, um, as the book calls them, smart UIs. So C sharp class, think back, a, whatever, a class ago, whenever that was, um, and you would build your your web forms or your wind forms, and your wind forms would basically be here's the UI, drag some controls on there, double clicky, creates an event handler, a method. You code up inside of that method what you want to have happen on that click or that event, and it's all kind of packaged up inside of the user interface. You know, theoretically, it's all packaged up inside of there. So what's the good, bad, and ugly about that? Well, the good is that it's all contained. It's all in one place. It's not this, you know, dispertinate pieces of code that don't really feel like they fit together and you don't really understand how they work together. Um, it's, it's simplistic when you're building simple applications, but it becomes increasingly more complex as you build more complex applications because for every control that potentially has an event, you have a method. And those methods, if you're not using good naming schemes and things like that, become very you know, chaotic and they're just all over the place. So that's the inherent good and evil around this smart UI concept. The web forms uses that same concept. You put a control on the form. If you want the control to do something, a button per se, you have to then wire up that event handler and go through those mechanics. Um, the other thing is, is that because everything is event driven, it's very hard to code, or I'm sorry, it's very hard to test that environment. You know, you have to do like browser scripting or things of that nature to actually test your code. And the best you can do then is click, 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 make sure that you're getting back on the screen what you expect, but there's no real objects to interact with or anything like that. So another kind of con to it. But it's very simplistic, it's very good for rad development, rapid development. Um, but when you're trying to get into large systems or complex things, it's obviously a pain in the butt. Alright. <coughs> so, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but so they decided, they, the formal they, decided that you know you need to have these separations. So you start to build classes, you start to build views, and then you have these interact with one another. So as you start to build more complex wind form applications, you started to build utility classes, you started to build model classes and then you had your events interacting with those so a lot of what we actually did in the, that class was this model view architecture 
you have your models that do the actual business logic and then you have your views. The MVC pattern in its origination was, and actually I may have a typo there. Okay, yeah, this is actually just the three tier model. So um, you have your UI, your model, and then you have this data access layer that allows you to connect to the data store whatever that may be and pull that data into your model so converting tables to objects that whole concept so again it's essentially this model but you added a third tier to try to abstract your objects from your data store okay so it makes that data access layers more interchangeable so if your data on the far right side were to change from database to a web service or SQL to Oracle or whatever the case may be they're not tightly coupled so you're not having to touch your models directly in order to make that data access adjustment you change your data access layer you change your data source ideally your access layer is kind of this go between between your data store and your models so you want it to kind of ride that line this is still a very good implementation concept it's just further back in the contemporary MVC model so your models sit you know you have view controller model and then behind that is your data access layer and your data store so the more recent convention is to not call it a three-tier architecture but it's an n-tier architecture because you can have multiple layers and you, this idea of modularity is kind of what you're shooting for and decoupling and being able to test independent units or layers within your application architecture. So, um, so that's kind of the gist of MVC. You know, we kind of talked through it last week. We built our controller. We built um, some basic classes and our views, and we just started passing data back and forth between them. So. Any questions on that? Hopefully that little segment of the chapter was reviewed. All right. All right, so the example that's in the book, and again, you can flip to it if you got it. If you don't, it's not a big deal, is page 57. So the concept that we're really trying to wrap our heads around is this idea of decoupling systems, OK? So we're taking what we have and what we're trying to build, which feels or appears to be one uniform system, and we're trying to break it apart into these segments. So when you start to build out your code, everything still feels very like tight together. And you often end up where you, know, you build a view, and that view is for that action, and then everything just kind of jams into one another. So even though you've got these three separate tiers, you still have everything pretty much tightly coupled. One is dependent on the other, and there's no you know, being flexible about it. Um, one of the things that you need to start to think about, because we're talking specifically about web development, is the evolution of devices as it pertains to web development. So where's your win? Where's your win in doing the MVC model when you're doing your web development? The win starts to appear when you start trying to deal with developing desktop websites and mobile or tablet websites. Okay? The goal, if I jump back to the beginning again, is you want to be able to have your controller, your models, and your data layer be consistent across that application. But you want your views, your, your UI environment, to respond from a server standpoint as much as possible to whatever device is, it's being served to. So you have this idea of, um, what's the word they use? Um, responsive design. I think it's like UX or XU is one of the acronyms they use. Um, and in that you're talking about building from the CSS level up or JavaScript level up this ability to adapt your UI. Well you can actually kind of supercharge that by even providing custom views on your model or on your model data so that that view itself is actually customized or architected in such a way that it works best for mobile environments. All right. So there's logic that we can do and there's checks that we can do in the controller to say, okay, is this a mobile browser or is this a desktop browser? And then work to try to direct the controller and the view engine to say, 
go use this view because this is a mobile view. Go use this view because it's a desktop view. So you have that flexibility starting to be built inherently into these, um, these design patterns. So the trick, though, is that you still don't want to hard code a lot of the stuff. You want to make it fluid. You want to make it dynamic. You want to make it so that you can go to one place, make a configuration change ideally, and then the whole system responds and changes with that. So the idea here is to take dependencies and be able to inject them into the application. All right, so let's kind of walk through this as a real world example. So, put together a new project. Let me see, week two. Chose the wrong project. File, new project. Yep. So we'll do new controller. All right, so let's say off of here we have public action result reset password. Okay, so we have an action that goes in and does a password reset. And we'll return. So with that, we're going to have to go through a series of steps. So let's assume that in theory we have a variable which is the string which is the email address. And we'll just hard code this. And then we're going to have a email sender class. And I'm going to go ahead and just generate that class. I'm going to move that into my models folder. Okay. And then I'm going to call send password reset email. So I'll say sender dot um, password reset email address. Generate that method in my email sender. Okay. So inside of here we'll do work. Put together an email, generate some sort of a string that's unique to that user, package it up inside of that email message, spin up an SMTP client, take that email message, send it via SMTP to the user. So that's what this method would do in theory. Right. So the trick here is what happens if this approach of sending email becomes obsolete and we have this happening in multiple places. 
Maybe the SMTP server changes. Maybe the type of email that we're sending changes. Maybe we stop sending email directly and instead when we go to send an email we're actually queuing up some sort of mass mailer service that's out there on the internet that we just send the email, email to as a string of text and then it takes it, spins it up, queues it up and then uses its you know, thousands of servers that send irregular interval emails out to customers so that we're not considered a spammer. So you have all these different options. Well, if we have this mass mailer and we have maybe this piece of software that works, uh, it's commercial, people buy it, and we want to be able to support sending it through MailChimp, sending it through Constant Contact, sending it through your own Exchange server, sending it through your own SMTP server, all these different options. We don't want to have our code hard-coded and dependent on that one single service. We want to make it more of a plug-in. We want to be able to say, all right, I'm using this type of approach to send mail. This is the method I want to use. Maybe you pick it from a drop-down or you check a box or whatever. <clears throat> so to do that, we have to inject into this what type of mail email sender this controller should use. And that injection, that dependency, is dynamic. So the, the tools or the mechanics that you have within most programming languages is the use of an interface. Okay? The reason they're called interfaces is because they act as the interface for your code to communicate with without knowing exactly what it's talking to on the back end. All right, so do we remember that from our C-sharp class? Good. Do you remember how to use one? A little bit. <laughs> All right. So the way that I, unless I have a really good concept of what I want my interface to look like, I usually start by implementing or building a class that I'll later then abstract my interface from. So in this case, you know, I need to send an email. So I created an email sender class. I needed a method to send the password reset email. So that's my class and my method. I may have to add more to it, but that's at least the basic mechanics of what I'm looking for. So Visual Studios does a really nice job of saying, okay, you're doing these things. If you want, you can come inside of the class body itself, so email sender. You can right click and you can choose refactor. And there's an option under the refactor menu to extract an interface. So you can pull that interface out. So you can say extract. No, oh, I need to make this public. Refactor, extract. All right. You can only create an interface off of public members, so if you have no public members, you can't create an interface. That's what that error was basically saying. So it knows that, at least inside of Visual Studios or the .NET framework, Microsoft's convention for, a for an interface is that it's whatever the name of the interface is, but you precede it with the letter I, a capital I. So it's I Email Sender. So it basically took our class name and said I Email Sender, and that's our interface name. <coughs> From there, it looked at all of the public properties and methods that were available and said choose which methods and properties you want to project into this interface. Now remember, the interface is also kind of like a blueprint. So if you have a class that chooses to implement an interface, you're required in order to conform to the blueprint of the interface, you have to implement every member of the interface. Every method, every property, excuse me, has to be in there. And if for some reason you don't implement one of the interfaces, your code won't compile. At the same time, it's kind of a nice thing because it's a contract to say you have to implement all this stuff. So if you create an interface and then you go, okay, well, I need this new feature, you can go and add it to the interface. And then through the wonderfulness of your compiler, it will tell you all the places where your class exists or your implementations of that interface exist. And then you'll have to go back and make those adjustments. So for this case, we're just going to do a password reset. I'm going to start by actually capitalizing password, and then I'll use the refactoring to rename it. 
because email sender implements I email sender, it automatically updated our name for us when we did the rename. Now the the beauty of all of this is when you define an interface, the interface becomes a type of its own. So your classes are types, your interfaces are types. So we can actually, instead of declaring variables as email sender, we can declare our variables as I email sender and then set it equal to or create instances of whatever type of sender we want to use. So I'll just put an I here. Have to include the namespace. And everything is still as good as it was. Now you still have dependency here, even though you've created an interface, because this code is saying, okay, well, I email sender sender equals a new email sender. So it's still kind of hard coded in there. So what we need to do is we need to take this new line out of the controller. We need to move it up and out and move it somewhere else. So the way that this is accomplished is that you'll create a constructor for your controller class. And inside of the constructor you're going to pass in the email sender parameter. And then we're also going to create a private uh, I email sender. And I'm just going to call it sender. Okay. So then what happens is that when this home controller is created for the first time, the email sender, the actual implementation, the class, the instance, is passed in as a parameter to the constructor instead of being coded down here inside of password reset. So here we'll say sender equals email sender param. We can now drop this line completely. And this controller, in theory at least, at this point, now knows nothing about what type of email sender is being used. All it knows is that in order for this controller to kick in to start, you have to provide an email sender, a, a class that implements I email sender. Okay? So now you may be looking at this and going, okay, that's cool. So, how do we actually pass I email sender into the controller? Well, that's where, and I'm actually not going to get into a whole lot more detail at this point. We get into chapter six and we start talking about tools that help facilitate this. So we could hard code this but then it requires us to build a whole controller mapper and being able to manage our controllers and when they're instantiated and how that all works to then generate these dependency objects and inject them. There's a framework that's open source called inject and it is a plugin that you can download and add to your MVC apps that will when you hook wire it in it does the dependency injection for you you basically say if you're calling this interface use this class and you have those lines of code kind of defined out once you define those relationships those mappings those bindings they call them then inject will just go about resolving your dependencies for you the MVC model itself actually has hooks for it So there's this class called a dependency resolver that's part of the MVC. And you can choose set resolver and we can actually create our own resolver if we wanted to. You basically have to implement the I dissolver or I dependency resolver class. So um, just to kind of close the loop I think I may go ahead and do that real fast. I'm going to add a new class. I'm going to call it the email resolver. I'll implement the I dependency resolver. So 
So you have these series of methods that come with the resolver. And basically what happens, so what the resolver is doing is the resolver gets a request and it says, okay, I'm looking for you to resolve this type. So the MVC framework will look at our home controller. It'll look that it needs an I email sender passed in. What the resolver is responsible to do is it's supposed to look at the type that it needs to resolve, I email sender, and it's supposed to look through its dictionary and figure out how do I resolve this? How do I, figure, how do I put it all together to say, okay, here's the class you need and create an instance of that. Now, inject is really nice because it will do it all dynamically. It'll do it automatically for you. Um, as long as you've got the right kind of environment set up, which is not very sophisticated, it will go through and do all that resolution for you, and it'll set up your dependencies, and it'll build them and create instances of your classes for you, and it'll automatically ship them off. Um, we're going to hand code it here, in this case, just so you can see exactly what those mechanics are, and then when we get into chapter six in about two weeks, we're going to actually load inject into our project and walk through what that whole thing looks like. So what will happen here is I'm just going to use this as a switch statement, service type. Uh, I'll do as an if statement. So I'll say if the service type dot name contains I email sender return new email sender. Okay, simple as that. Else return null. And then get services essentially does the same thing. In theory, you could have multiple classes that implement the same interface and therefore return all instances. So we'll say if service type name contains I email sender. return I'm going to say new array of new email sender else return new array object array of zero So from the top, get service. So if my service type, so if the type that's passed in contains the name I email sender, and we'll put some breakpoints and we can walk through this, return that email sender class that we created. The else, return null. We don't have anything to resolve. Um, get services does basically the same thing, but it's looking for an array or some sort of a collection to be returned. So in this case, we say, again, if it's I email sender, create an array of email senders and return them, which will just be one. Else, return an, ob an empty array of just objects. So it's basically an array that has no length, but it's just there to comply with what it wants returned for the interface. Okay. All arrays, collections, and other things, unless they're specially defined, always implement I enumerable. So if that was a little bit of a leap there. That's why that is. Okay. So we can put in here email resolver. I thought it was called. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. New email resolver. So now if we run our app, so accessibility, we need to make sure this interface is public, F5 to run.
guess we're supposed to implement some additional some additional interfaces that don't actually exist. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road for tonight. Um, again, in two weeks we'll go through and talk about it in more detail. I'm not going to spend a half an hour going through and implementing another interface. Okay, so so that's the basic concept though. Is you have this class that does the mechanics of resolving these dependencies for you. Okay, that's what your goal is to achieve. And then being able to store that in a configuration somewhere, be it a database, be it another class file, maybe it's an XML document, wherever that may be, you want to be able to kind of offload those configuration settings and not make them compiled, embedded into your program. And then using a dependency manager to be able to serve up those classes as needed based on the configuration. Okay. All right. So then the final piece that I kind of want to talk through is building tests. Built into Visual Studios is the ability for you to build a series of tests to test your application. Okay, These tests come in as projects and they can actually be configured they're configured to be run prior to compiling and deploying your program. So the idea behind building your tests is that when you start building your application you have these actions, these methods. What you're looking to do is you want to test both your controller actions as well as your model methods or functions and make sure that they're acting and interacting the way that you would expect. So you set up these base use cases and you say, you know, if I call password reset and I pass it an email address, I expect it to return, I don't know, true to me if the email was sent successfully. If I get a false back, then that means I either have an environment issue or I'm not coding things correctly, whatever that means. So these tests are here to kind of act as stoppers for you to say, okay, hold on. I made a change in my system, I made a change in my program, maybe it's even six months later, and that change had a domino effect somewhere else, and one of my tests ends up failing. So the idea here is kind of this, uh, the term is test-driven development, or TDD, and what you're really kind of aiming for is the idea that as you develop, you build tests, and in some cases, People would like to tout it, and I don't know if it's necessarily true, but your tests even drive your development. So your tests should model real-world environments. So as you're writing your tests, you'll say, oh, well, actually, I'm going to need to do this, or somebody may need to do this in the real world. Therefore, I should build a method that facilitates that. So as you build your tests, you may find holes in your APIs or holes in the code that you're building because you'll go, oh, well, once I made it through steps A and B, in order to do step C, I needed to add this method. So it's kind of this back and forth between the two. <clears throat> so inside of your solution, you can actually right click, add new project. You can do a unit test project. I'll just go ahead and say yes. And your tests come in as a project with a class. And your class is decorated with an attribute called test class. Your method is decorated with an attribute called test method and then the name of the method. The method name should describe whatever the test is. Okay, So I'm just going to let it be test method 1 and I'm going to declare a boolean is true and set it to true and then I'm going to use the assert class And I'm going to use is the is true method, and I'm going to say is true. Do an F6 to compile. 
I'll do tests and I'll say run all tests. And you'll get a test explorer on the left hand side. And basically what happened is I compiled that test, ran it, and waited to see if it was going to throw any exceptions. Since no exceptions were thrown, the test is considered good. Okay. The assert class, all of these methods that are run, basically execute in one of two ways. They either execute and silently succeed, which means that they pass on and continue to move. You'll notice that they're all Boolean options. Because they are equal, not equal, not the same, the same is false, is true, is null, is not null. <clears throat> what will happen is these will do an evaluation. If the evaluation is true, silently succeeds. If the evaluation is not true, it will actually throw an exception at the runtime level, basically declaring that this test is bad, or that it, was fit, that it failed. Those exceptions are then interpreted by the testing engine, and the engine then you know, utilizes that data to notify you of that case. Now, this is an overly simplistic example. I'll do false here. And run the test. And then we get a red no symbol. <clears throat> what you would do in a real world situation is that you wouldn't just declare a true false and then test it. You would actually have the use of your classes, the use of your code in here. You would call your methods, have it return a value, and then you would test whether or not you actually got back what you expected. You assert, you know, um, if this was like a student information system, you would say, go get student, num student ID 12345. You know that that student has the first name of Kevin, the last name of Gantos, and you would assert all of those properties to make sure that it came, that A, you got an object back, and B, that those properties aligned with what you expected. If it fails, then either your test data is bad, or something in the mechanics of it getting that student failed and this test should be able to identify it for you. So by running your app, and I think and I'm pretty sure there's a way to wire up the two, I just don't really call it right now, so that it will run the tests before every compilation, so it'll compile, it'll test, and then it'll run. And I don't recall off the top of my head, I'll have to go back and research how you wire those pieces together. And we'll talk about it more in later chapters. But this idea of building your test and having it dictate or drive what you're doing is kind of the whole core of this, is that you now have a programming environment that is decoupled, that's interdependent with your controllers and your models and your views, and now you're able to actually build tests. You're able to build tests and evaluate what's coming in and out. You don't have this highly coupled environment that's all event driven and you have no control. Um, there's ways even through um, specifically written tests that you can test calling a controller, passing a value, and then evaluating not so much the view that's returned, but the view class that comes back and what that HTML looks like. So you can start to evaluate is what I'm sending and what I'm getting back accurate you have that flexibility to do those types of things. So it's definitely much better than what you would have had with doing either a web forms environment or wind forms even. Okay. So any questions around this? I know it was kind of a lot, but also not a lot. It's kind of abstract. So. No. Yeah. If you have like a bunch of methods that interact with the sequence of action, mm -hmm. how do do you have to test each method individually? Or? So it's kind of it, the short answer is yes. Okay, you have to build a test. If you want to truly test each one of those methods, you have to write the test for each method. There's no automated testing in the case of that you're thinking of. I wrote all these methods. Go write me a test for each one of these. The system for the most part it's not smart enough to know that because depending on what those methods return, if anything, it's hard to actually you know automate a test like that. So that's kind of the 
the double-edged sword of test-driven development is that, in my mind, it's like you got to write twice as much code. You have to write your code that you're going to test with, and they recommend doing it before you actually write your code. Then you write the code that's actually going to be running the program, and then you have to evaluate that your test is accurate against that code. So once you build the test and you know the test is good, you never have to write it again. And as you modify and refactor your program, that test should always hold true. But in the short term, you end up essentially writing twice as much code. <laughs> so, so yeah, so if you write 10 methods, you're going to have to write 10 tests. Or at least you're going to have to write enough test code to test those 10 methods. So whether they work as a system or independently. And that's kind of the other side of it too, is as you're doing the test-driven development, you'll want to write them in small units if possible. You don't want to write one big test because all you're going to get back is that the test failed. So if you write one test that tests the entire system, whatever that may be, and it comes back and either succeeds or fails, well, that's about as good as a compiler. It's actually worse than the compiler. It basically tells you that it either worked or it didn't, but you don't know specifically where it failed. So you kind of have, you know, it's a little bit of both. <coughs> All right. Let me see. That was pretty much the whole chapter. It talks in a bit more detail on it, but it's honestly not a whole lot more. Uh, one thing that might just be of interest. This project, it's actually referenced at the very end of the chapter, is a browser automation project. So what this allows you to do is you can go out, you can download the server component, which is a Java-based component, and you can run it. And then you can script, and I think there's actually a plugin for Firefox that will do like macro program or recording. So you load this script in, or this plugin into Firefox, you open up Firefox, you launch your app. And then it will actually capture for you your mouse clicks. You then can take that script and you can put assertions, just like you can in your tests, and say, you know, you click this button and then the following label should have this text inside of it. And you reference it by an ID or by a name. And you say it should have this, or this radio button should be selected, or whatever the case may be. And again, it can throw you assertion, you know, good or bad but you're actually testing at the UI level versus testing at the API level. And the server component is you can take those scripts, you push them to the server, and you run them in an automated fashion. So if you think about the full deployment model of an application, as you write your program, you write your tests. You run your tests to verify that your application is good from an API level. You then deploy the app, maybe to a test environment, then you run Selen Selenium, against that test environment and it actually goes through and emulates clicking through the pages. Your Selenium tests then go back and determine, I clicked this, I clicked this, did the UI return to me what I'm expecting? Did I get a red, yellow screen error? Did I get an actual page? Is the content on the page correct? And this whole ecosystem kind of starts to evolve from that. Trying to do this automated testing so that you don't have to either yourself click through all these screens or hire somebody if you're in a slightly larger organization to test all these screens. When you start to get into very complex systems you have a lot of weird things that can start to arise that you just can't foresee even as you're coding it. You know they're not compile errors, they're runtime issues. Uh, you'll make a change over here and it'll affect a system component over there because of some something that happens in between. <clears throat> so these are actually very, this tool is especially is a very impressive tool. Um, we've used it for some of the stuff we do at work, just not so much to 
do the assertions and the testing in that case, but for us to be able to record a macro and then play it and let it go through and do the clicks for us so that we don't have to do all the clicks every time, you know, and then just setting milestone assertions. Like we have a, a user account creation and setup process. Well, we have Selenium scripts that'll go through and allow you to, you know, create an account, fills in all the text boxes for you, hit submit, boom, email shows up. You, we then click the email, activate the account. All right, go on to step two of the Selenium script. Boom, logs in as that user, tests to see if there's a, a student in that system, adds a student, goes through all of that. We then approve it, run the Selenium script. Boom, now the student is active. We see a status change through the script because we're checking IDs in the type of HTML that's rendered inside. And then that script is able to tell us you know, something that may take us 15 or 20 minutes to test by hand because we're doing clicks and clicks and filling out forms, we can test it within two to five minutes. If we were really willing to put our nose to the grindstone, we could automate that and then as we do deployments, we can just have it tested nightly and then shoot us reports and say, hey, this is working, this isn't working, things like that. So, I mean, these are processes that big businesses use. Um, you know, they do it to the point where they have systems that do tests and then they have systems that respond to the tests. So if, say, you make a code change, you compile, you deploy, you deploy it to a server, then you have something like this that comes in behind and actually tests that application in the live environment. If it finds either statistically that the application's um, return on investment, number of people signing up declines, It'll identify what the error is, and then it'll actually roll back to the old version that still worked, and then send a bug report to the developer and say, hey, by the way, your, your update broke something. So you have this really fast response cycle. So these are tools that facilitate doing those kinds of things. So it's a lot of infrastructure work on the front end. You've got to build these systems to do this and use these tools to do it, but once you've got them in place, I mean, you can, you can run pretty fast, and have a pretty high uptime on your application. So things to kind of consider. So yeah, so Selenium's a good one. The other one it talks about I'm not that familiar with, it's waiting.org. And according to what this little description says here is that it's basically a .NET library. So if you're really all about doing it in .NET and don't want to get into the Java space, um, this isn't quite as robust as Selenium. A lot of it is program based, you're basically writing um, scripts and plugins for IE, so you're trying to automate IE browsing. So I don't know enough about this, I may research it myself, but it's definitely uh, an alternative if you want to keep yourself in the Microsoft camp. So. <clears throat> Alright, any questions? I know the class kind of starts off a little